Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The text for this morning's message is the Gospel reading from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. One of the most important functions of our Gospel text is to help us understand the, our suffering a little bit more. Our suffering is in fact because of our sin and sinfulness. It infects all of humanity. It is something that we all deal with in our lives. But we cannot point specifically to any one sin as the reason for any one sinner's suffering. Sometimes when we get sick, we get injured, we want to take the blame. If only I had done this, if only I had led my life in a better way, maybe I wouldn't have gotten sick in this way. Some behaviors are considered to be more risky than other behaviors. If you smoke, you might get lung disease or cancer. If you overeat, you might get heart disease. We might even say that there are some behaviors that are more healthy than others. If you exercise regular, regularly, eat healthy green vegetables and spend out, time outdoors, these are considered healthy activities that will support health. I do not want to deny these things, for they are true. The Lord does want us to, to do these healthy things, to take care of our, our bodies. He values our lives. The Lord does, not, does want us to care for our neighbor by washing our hands and being careful when we are sick with how we interact with others. The Lord does want us even today to honor our authorities and the advice they give us regarding the pandemic that we now experience in our country. The problem is this, what happens when someone gets sick and has lived a healthy life, life has done the right things to support their health. I know people who have practiced healthy lifestyles all their lives and yet they get sick and even die at a very young age. Sometimes we are tempted to judge those people. What did they do to deserve this? What kind of unhealthy things did they do? Maybe even we might ask the question, how did they sin that the Lord would bring this upon them? The real answer is maybe they didn't do anything at all. Maybe this illness was actually completely out of their control, and there was nothing that they specifically did to earn the punishment of suffering. It seems that in our lives, the Lord gives to us times of suffering, and it is inexplicable. The suffering is hard, and the suffering afflicts us, and we don't like it. We even question the Lord, and we cry out, Why are you doing this among us, O Lord? The psalmist gets it right from Psalm 88. But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors, I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me, your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long, they close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me, my companions have become darkness. So here the psalmist does give credit where credit is due for the suffering he experiences. He puts it directly at the feet of the Lord. It is the Lord's doing. And this is hard for us as Christians because as Christians, even in our lives, we sometimes think if I believe in Jesus, then the Lord's going to make things smooth. He's going to take care of it all. He's going to make sure that I live a healthy life and and take away my suffering. We cannot expect, though, the authority of our lives to bow to our expectation and wishes. We cannot twist his arm by doing this thing or that thing and make him do something that we want him to do. We are not in control of God. That's not how it works. So why does God give us suffering? Maybe in the end it is quite an unanswerable question, especially in the midst of suffering, except one thing. We know that God uses suffering in this world to accomplish His will. 
Because of sin and death, suffering has become a normal part of life. Even death has become normal for us. And the Lord uses suffering. And He even uses death to get what He wants done, to produce the good He desires. The most important and greatest example of this is when Jesus came to die on a cross and He suffered Himself. His death brings the forgiveness of sins to the whole world. Jesus humbled himself, even to the point of death, for you. Jesus is the Lamb who is led to the slaughter, who is the Lamb of God. He is the one who takes away the sins of the world, and should we expect also that the Lord would utilize suffering and death, even in our daily lives, to get good things accomplished that He desires? The Lord does that best of all. He takes evil, even sin, even death, and He makes it do what He wants it to do. His will will be done. In our text today, Jesus gives us a little example. There is a man who is born blind, and the disciples ask the question, Who is it that sinned? Is it the man or his parents? It is a question that assumes that if you are blind, you have committed some egregious sin above any other kinds of sins. If there is sin, then there is consequence. Blindness is considered a hard consequence for sin, either in that man's life or in his parents' life. Jesus completely obliterates the entire idea he says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Comes right out and says it. God will use this sickness, will use this illness for the purpose that he desires. God has a good work to accomplish that will mean salvation for people. And then Jesus heals the man by putting mud on his eyes and telling him to wash in the pool of Siloam. This healing actually creates great controversy in the community in which Jesus is living and doing his ministry. From where does he come? The question is, is Jesus someone who is legitimate? The Pharisees, they don't think that he's legitimate because he actually did this work on the Sabbath, and they say that if he had was, was from God, if he was a legitimate prophet, then he would not have broken the law by working on the Sabbath. The blind man that can now see just confesses what happened. And he says and believes that only someone who is from God could, could accomplish this great work. Because of his insistence that Jesus is from God, the Pharisees get very angry and they shun him and reject him and cast him away. Jesus hears of this, and he talks with the once blind man, and he says, Do you believe that I am? Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answers, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And the once blind man says, Lord, I believe. And the blind man then worships Jesus, and Jesus gives him his word saying, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees heard this and they asked, they asked Jesus a very profound question. Were they blind too? And Jesus' response to them is the key to understanding what Jesus is doing. He tells the Pharisees that if they were blind, they're uh, they would have no guilt, but since they, they see things, since they see the truth, their guilt remains. And the Pharisees believed that they saw the truth. They believed that they did things right. They believed that they knew the law and followed it in the most perfect way as they received it. They also believed in their position, in their community. They believed that because they had so much wealth and so much authority and so much standing within the community that God was blessing them because of their goodness. But Jesus indicates 
that since they believe they are powerful with regard to law and society, that they think they see well, their guilt actually remains. The basic truth is that in sin and sinfulness, no, no human is strong. The, man, the blind man believed in his weakness and in the strength of Jesus because Jesus helped him see. He didn't do it to himself or make it happen by some great feat or magnificent accomplishment. It was simply a gift. The blindness of the once blind man was a tool that the Lord used to get the interest, the attention of the once blind man who began to hear what Jesus said and believe in Jesus and who he is. When Jesus told the man who he was, that is when the man came to believe. Jesus used the blind man's suffering through the course of many years to prepare the blind man to receive the very word of God that would transform his life and that would make him a child of God. But now consider the Pharisees. They too are listening to Jesus. They are arguing about Jesus' identity and they are concerned about what Jesus is doing to their own authority, but they're hearing what Jesus is saying. One of the Pharisees asked the question, as said before, are we also blind? And if you think about it, it is, it is a strange question. It is a question revealing that the Pharisee that asks it actually, actually knows that Jesus is talking something about more than what meets the eye. Though the Pharisee does not have the faith at the moment, the once blind man does, and there's obviously something at work, and Jesus is forming and shaping things to bring even the Pharisees to faith. Jesus uses the formerly blind man's blindness, not to, just to teach and help the blind man, but also to teach and to help the Pharisees who needed to hear too. And from Scripture, we know that we are there and the Pharisees who hear the word of God, they come to believe. We too experience a cathartic moment. Today, on, the, on account of the blindness of the blind man, we see today that we in our sin and sinfulness, we cannot see. Our sinfulness causes us to be blind also to what is the truth. It causes us to be blind to who God is in our lives, that we truly, in and of ourselves, do not know the creator of all things, even our own lives. The truth of the matter is we have no strength, and the Lord does not regard those who are wise in their own conceit. Our suffering and even dying shows us this reality, and when we forget, we will be reminded, because suffering and dying will eventually come to all of us. Suffering comes to us, and the Lord brings it, but he has a reason for it, the suffering we see and the suffering we experience tells us that we are weak. We are not as strong as we think we are. We cannot fulfill the truth in our lives apart from the Lord. It tells us that we are not really powerful, that we cannot see or understand the truth. Our suffering and the suffering we see around us gives us perspective on our lives. It helps us to realize our complete and total blindness and ultimately our complete and total dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It helps us know that we need something from outside. We need the Lord to reach into our lives, to give us the healing we need, to help us to see where once we were blind. In, in blindness, in frailty, in futility, Jesus comes and he gives you himself. He gives you his presence and he says, I am here for you. He says, I love you. He says, I forgive you. And he gives to you the truth himself. He gives to you holiness and righteousness. It is for you now. He gives us all, not in the washing in the pool of Siloam, but he gives it to you in the washing of his word, which is living water. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, 
and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.